Hello, it's uh, Paul Beckwith, and uh, I'm continuing my discussions of radiative heating of an ice-free Arctic Ocean by the authors Christina Pistone, Ian Eisenman, and V. Ramanathan. Okay, so I'm going to get right back into the details of this paper because they're very important to what we'll what we can expect when we have a blue ocean event, and I'm still I, I, I'm still expecting with high probability that we have such an event by 2022, you know, the next three, four years or so. Okay, so um, continuing from where I left off in the last video on this paper, basically the disappearance of sea ice alters the Earth's energy balance because a low albedo open ocean surface typically absorbs about six times more solar radiation than a surface covered with sea ice and snow. Okay, and I showed this in a previous video he, in, in, in a previous video when I showed you um, this curve here. So we're replacing the ice with snow on the ice that melts out. We're replacing it with the dark ocean water underneath. And um, so we're seeing that type of, you know, basically six times more energy being absorbed by the water than, it, than is absorbed by the sea ice and snow because the water is much darker. It has a substantially higher al um, albedo, the sea ice and snow. Okay, this can have a huge role in the energy balance of the climate system. So from 1979 to 2011, the global mean increase in solar heating equivalent from loss of sea ice over this time period was 0.21 watts per square meter. The, when there's zero sea ice, from 1979 to when there's zero sea ice, the total global increase is 0.71 watts per square meter. Okay, so that they call this the extreme worst, worst case scenario, complete disappearance of Arctic sea ice throughout the sunlit portion of the year. Now remember this is very crucial because remember this curve here showing solar insulation uh, as a function of latitude and right at the North Pole here, this is at the June solstice, June 21st, uh, very, very high insulation in the Arctic. And as you go to September, you know, in September at the very, very North Pole, 90 degree north, the, it goes to darkness in September 21st. So loss of sea ice here, um, you know, uh, basically when there's complete loss of sea ice, but you're in darkness, you're not going to get that additional heating. But the Arctic ice extends down to about 70 degrees north. You know, this is a 60 degree north curve. There's still sig significant am amounts of ice, you know, in September. But you need to consider the amount of sunlight coming into the Arctic from the sun when you're talking about the albedo of the uh, sea ice. Okay, so now the global climate models differ widely, differ widely, wildly in terms of the level of global warming at which the Arctic becomes ice free. Okay, um, so these are the models here. This is a number of models here, and this is what they're saying in terms of the uh, baseline extent of the Arctic. Okay, and then this is the sea ice sensitivity, the millions of square kilometers lost per degree Kelvin, according to all of the different models. And this is the observation. So we've, the sea ice is going much, much faster than any of the models is saying. And this is the global warming expected for an ice-free, um, the global warming for an ice-free Arctic in terms of Kelvin or, you know, one Kelvin change is one Celsius change. So, you know, many models say that we have to be from five to 15 degrees Celsius warmer uh, for the ice to be all gone. And here's, here's what the actual, actuality uh, appears to be based on the observations, okay? So mo the models are, are not doing a good job with sea ice. So what the, so for this study, they looked at the satellite data. They looked at the series, the clouds, cloud and earth radiant energy system series record. Um, basically, they looked at the ice-free locations in the Arctic and they looked at the clouds that would form above them and they looked at the radiative forcing change 
and they found that the clouds, um, most studies find that the clouds don't change too much. The cloud coverage and the cloud optical de depth, the amount of absorption in, in given clouds does not change too much. Um, you know, but, you know when, when the sea ice is vanishing. So using those numbers, they came up with, so this is a key result of, of the study. So this is the Arctic albedo loss. So, you know, I talk about the 52% from 79 dropping to 48%. This is a fluctuation of that curve and the variation is the gray. Um, uh, between 1979 to 2016 is the black line. This is the observations from the series satellite. If the clouds continue doing what they're doing, you know, what they've been doing in this period, then this projects an ice-free Arctic. It projects to an albedo, you know, maybe, you know, under 46%, maybe 45%. So the albedo would have changed from about 52 to 45% between 1979's ice and an ice-free Arctic. Now, if the if we have, now the other two extremes are if it's completely cloud-free, the albedo of the whole Arctic would drop down to about 15%. Okay, the Arctic would be much, much darker. It would be basically, you know, the Arctic Ocean, an ocean environment, 15% cloud-free. If there's clouds, uh, you know, if, the, if there's more clouds as a result of the loss of the ice, then you get this type of estimate. So if the whole thing is socked in with clouds, you might, um, you know, have this type of uh, percentage here, you know, about 40% um, reflectivity or albedo. Um, you know, this is considered the, the most likely situation here. Now, you can take that albedo and you can convert it into global heating, basically. So this is the effect of the ice loss since 1979. The radiative heating, this is where that 0 0.21 um, watts per square meter number comes in for the heating thus far you know, up, up to 2016, basically. Um, and then this is what we can expect. If we extrapolate this, so if the cloud cover doesn't um, change too much, we can expect this, this radiative heating. And this is, this is uh, basically if, well, well this is the, this is the uh, if the clouds don't change too much. This is what they expect, and this gives you the 0 0.71 watts per square meter Heating, okay, the, the, the result of the paper. Um, this is the case, if you go cloud-free, then you get three times more heating. And if you go uh, completely overcast and socked in, you know, lot open water, a lot more clouds covering the whole Arctic, then you get a about half of the 0 0.71, you get about 0 0.37 watts per square meter. Okay, so those are, the, those are the ranges that we can expect when we have zero sea ice. Um, there is some uncertainty in the clouds, but most studies are saying the cloud fraction will stay at about 81% or so, you know, in the Arctic with a complete loss of sea ice, and therefore we'll have the 0 0.71 watts per square meter global heating and we'll have the one that'll be the one trillion tons of co2 equivalent heating okay so this th these two graphs are key for what we can expect when we have a blue ocean event okay now um, so this is the so average over the globe the global radiative heating will be 0 0.71 watts per square meter. If you just look at the Arctic, now the, the, if you, the Arctic is only about roughly 1 in 30th of the whole globe area, or 3.3%. So the heating in the Arctic region alone will be 21 watts per square meter annual mean solar heating over the Arctic Ocean relative to the 1979 baseline. If you divide this number by 30, you get the 0 0.71 watts per square, meter, per square meter. So this is the equivalent heating over the entire globe. This is what we would have in the Arctic, huge heating in the Arctic. And I've talked about the latent heat effect. Um, you know, there's no sea ice to keep the Arctic cold the, at the surface, so the temperature 
you know, skyrockets. Remember the, uh, you know, you have a kilogram of ice, you melt the ice with a certain amount of energy, okay? That ice ends up water just above the freezing point. Then you apply the same amount of energy that melted that one kilogram, and that one kilogram of water would heat up to 80 degrees Celsius. Now, of course, it's going to be mixed and stuff. Basically, the water temperature in the Arctic is going to skyrocket when there's no sea ice. Now, in, now how does this 0.71 watt per square meter number from this study compare to previous studies? Well, the number was found to be in 2011, 0 0.65 watts per square meter. Uh, a different study um, came up with, in 2015, came up with minus 0 0.825 watts per square meter. These are globally average numbers. And then um, a study, I think it was by the same author, Pistone, for this paper, they used um, series observations through 2011 um, and they estimated, they came up with 0 0.68 watts per square meter. Um, the present study is 0 0.71. So these numbers are all consistent. So we pretty much know what's going to happen in terms of the additional heating when we have loss of sea ice. Now remember, of the 0 0.71 watts per square meter of globally average heating with no sea ice, 0 0.21 is al has already occurred. So we're going to get another 0 0.5 basically. Um, Right, about half of, the, of that 0 0.21 that's already occurred, about half occurred between 20, 2000 to 2016, and the other half occurred between 1979 and, and 1999. So 20-year period, 16-year period. So it's roughly occurring, you know, in, in terms of the additional radiative heating, it's occurring roughly, you know, linear, and, and the satellites agree with uh, ground measurements, etc. So here's what we see. This is the change in absorbed solar radiation, January, February, March through December. This is from 1979 to 2016. So if you take the average of these, you get 0 0.21. That's average over the entire year. And, you know, it's obviously there's zero absorbed solar radiation in the winter dark months. But the average of the whole year is 0 0.21, although it does peak at about 0.7. But 1979 to ice free, we get this type of curve. So you can see, you know, there's going to be huge um, amounts of absorption going on in the summer months. If you take the average of this curve over the whole year using zeros in these months, you get 0 0.71. Okay, that's because you get zeros here added to these. But so basically, the warming in the summer is going to going to be enormous. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, and then, and then it goes on and it talks about, um, you know, this is important here. Okay, how do we get the, the one trillion tons number? Okay, so radiative forcing F relative to an arbitrary reference value R is 5.35 watts per square meter times the natural logarithm of X over R. So, um, so this basically says that a doubling of atmospheric CO2 causes a radiative forcing of 3.71 watts per square meter, the climate sensitivity. Now, the Arctic causing Arctic, loss of Arctic sea ice complete is 0 0.71 watts per square meter. This translates to an increase in the atmospheric CO2 concentration of a difference of 56.7 uh, ppm additional um, concentration. That's the equivalent. Now, one parts per million of atmospheric CO2 is equivalent to 7.77 gigatons. So this increase of 56.7 ppm is 441 gigatons. The mean airborne fraction of CO2 that stays in the atmosphere is about 0 0.44. Okay, um, right? Other stuff goes in the ocean, goes back in the soils, etc. So if you divide the 441 by 0.44, you basically get a trillion tons. Okay, that's where the trillion tons number comes from. So 0.71 watts per square meter of radiative forcing globally is equivalent to one trillion tons of CO2 being put into the atmosphere. Divide that by 40 gigatons per year, the, the present day emissions, that gives you the 25 years of warming. Okay, so... 
This is the Arctic. I'll continue in the last video. Thanks for listening.